This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, AKA the Python Hyena, right out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And here we are, July 16th, 2021. We're, you know, we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic thing. But I like to look at happier things, you know, like the woman I'm interviewing tonight. She's been a guest on here before, and she was a lovely guest, folks. I give you one of the dolls from the valley. Yes, beyond the valley of the dolls star herself, Marcia McBroom. How do you do, Marcia? Hi, Greg. How are you? I love your <laughs> earrings. Look at those. Thank you. They're oh. from Burkina Faso, West Africa. You know what? That's one of the many African countries that I have visited. I've never been to Africa, but I watch a lot of African wildlife videos. That's why where I got my name, the Python hyena, you know? Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I watch a lot of African wildlife videos, you know, and uh, it, they just got some very interesting wildlife there. But uh, never seen any safari videos regarding those earrings, though. <laughs> Wait, what does it say? Oh, they oh, said my sure? internet connection is unstable. And then my necklace. Yeah. It's in making a, my own jewelry mm -hmm. with the help of a friend of mine from the Philippines. Mm hmm. Wow. Well, yeah. you're cl well, all the girls from Beyond the Valley of the Dolls were very classy, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you're freezing up a little bit on there. I know you are yeah. too. Oh, am I? Yeah. Yeah. And there's um there's a block in front of me. What does it say? This meeting is being recorded. Yeah. Continue. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. So okay, so your face is blocked out because of this thing in front of the oh. screen. I could Does see you matter? perfectly fine. I could see you oh, perfectly okay. fine. Okay, well, that's all that matters. Yeah, because when the, when this goes up, we're, we'll see both of us anyway. So, uh, oh. and quite frankly, people want to see you, not me. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know? funny. Yep, mm -hmm. especially with cool earrings like that, you know. Yeah, that's, thank you. That's even more yeah, cool. I'm in the that's even more cooler more than cool. Apache Ramos, uh, former Afro. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, yeah. I had, I had Apache on here for the third time and he sent oh. me this link for the, the zoo crew too, which, uh, the warriors are involved with. And, uh, I love that he reached out to me, you know, he had to, uh, he had enough faith and respect for me as an interviewer that he'd reach out to me and, I'm helping them promote that, you know, and I have a few people on from that. Yep. And so um, what was fun, though, was I had him on there and I, I told him I was going to ask, find out which one of the McBroom sisters shaved off his afro. <laughs> That's cute. That is very cute. Yeah. I he love has a great sense of humor. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He's got these put pictures on Facebook right now of him wearing a Randy Macho Man Savage shirt. And I'm like, who are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> now, his oh, nurse, God. his nurse there, Norma, she, she should be wearing that. <laughs> I know. I know. She's amazing. She is. She's she went up, she, she was on camera with him a little bit, you know, and I could tell she had her hands full. <laughs> telling you but just the fact that she survived vietnam is amazing to me yeah she's a strong yeah. woman and she's yeah, even stronger she's now dealing with apache <laughs> yes yes we love but her. it's so wonderful she keeps it real yeah. that's what's good about it mm -hmm. and we all love apache ramos shout out to apache ramos because i know he loves the mcbroom sisters always always and what I love it are my um, two grandchildren having, uh, well, I have actually four grandchildren, but Apache's daughter is my daughter-in-law. And um, it's just fun that they, that, that the 
grandchildren have um, two grandparents who were in cult movies. That's fun. Even though they're too young to really know anything about the movies yet. <laughs> and you two were in uh, cool cult films. Yeah, yeah, really great. Look at this. This nice, oh. I think this is Criterion release, Blu-ray of Beyond oh. the Valley of the Dolls. Yeah, they've reissued um, it, yeah. Just yeah. like they've remastered uh, Jesus Christ Superstar mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rad. there you are. There's Dolly. Yep, they got everybody in on there. The, this is a great release, too. I, I love this. Wow. Lots of stuff wow. on there. Yep. Uh -huh. I well, grabbed, I I'm going to show you this. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the New York Dolls. Sylvain, Sylvain told me that they got their name from Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and that they had a big poster of us from the movie at their studio and that so many stars signed the poster that they donated it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So that was exciting to hear. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's funny, as things go along, we learn more and more things that we didn't even know before. You know, it's very interesting. After all of these years, there's still new things to learn. Yeah. I like your background, though. I love the color of your walls. Is that like a, a, a violet? Yeah. That, that uh, looks... yeah. What it is, this, this room I call my Mother Earth room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a BA in anthropology, so I'm very interested in artifacts and cultures from around the world. So this room, I, I had it painted lilac, and I have a wall with angels and another wall with children and animals, and then indigenous peoples and Frida Carla, because I'm in the Frida Carla cult group. So it's really, I love this room. It's very you, meditative. Do you have an Apache room? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, I do have, I do have wonderful pictures with him. <laughs> he, he's going to listen to my, this. I have my warrior's jacket, too. I have a big warrior's jacket, which is great. Well, I imagine you're probably tougher than they are. <laughs> well, it's funny, because I was raised in the booby down Bronx, so yeah. We, we know what it's all about. <laughs> New Yorker, through and through. Well, you know, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls came out two years before I was born. So I just turned 49 a um, couple of weeks ago. And, well, uh, congratulations. and I can't believe that because uh, you and Dolly and the girls were only 39. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. You're only Forever. 39, so I don't Forever. know how that works out. <laughs> I know, isn't that fascinating? I say, do the math. <laughs> hey, do that's how math. that's how I got through school. <laughs> I just told my teachers how young they looked. <laughs> Saved me from writing exams. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That is funny. Yeah. So you got your BA. My cat has a BA too. It's in laziness. <laughs> <laughs> it's I funny because in, in the ancient Inca um, civilization, laziness was punishable by death. Isn't that something? So my, my, um, if you lived in the Andes Mountains in ancient times, you had to know how to work your butt off or else it's all over. Well, here, laziness is punishable by freeloading in my apartment and treats. <laughs> <laughs> but she keeps the mice away, you know. So uh, she no, does, she earns her living. And she no, keeps you company. I love kitty does, cats. I, I love, love my cat. cat. I love my cat. <laughs> yeah. I love animals in general. Yeah. My kitty's a rescue, you know. I don't know where he is. He's around here somewhere. Sometimes yeah. when he comes around here, I grab him. And apparently there's a lot of my guests say that they love it when I stick my cat up in the interview. So we may see him. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> but, but what do you think? 50 years. Actually, it's now 51 years. I was going to reach mm -hmm. out last year, but COVID kind of prevented everything. Because last time I talked to you, it was by phone. 
but right. unfortunately, you know, our, our station's still closed. It's funny. I've been going back to the movie theater since July 2020, but I can't get mm -hmm. into our station. So okay. one of my guests introduced me to Zoom, and I'm like, this is nice. <laughs> I got to admit, yeah. I, I, I could schedule these and not have to call to find out whether the studio is uh, right. up, occupied. Well, thank goodness I have a husband who knows how to set up all these tech things because I am totally tech illiterate, unfortunately. Shout out to yeah. Luke Small. <laughs> yes. Shout out to him. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. For making Save this happen. Day. Yep. But uh, yeah, 50, 51 years. What do you think of that? Uh, it's mind blowing to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet in many parts of it feel as if it was just as if it were just yesterday. So that's what's so weird about life when you realize that, oh my God, most of my life is behind me, not in front of me. And yet it seems like it was just um, the other day. So it is very, very um, weird, shall we say. Did you yeah. get the contact info I gave you on Harrison Page? I sent in that email. Um, I didn't look at it yet, but I am yeah. looking forward to reading it uh, tomorrow because I do want to reach out to him. Yeah, I haven't talked to him no. since uh, 2017 when I interviewed him, so I haven't kept in touch. But uh, but as uh, far as I know, uh, you should have hopefully no problem getting hold of him. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. I have kept yeah. in touch with Dolly. <laughs> and okay. thank yeah, and uh, I'm keeping in touch with you. And of course, I kept in touch with Apache. <laughs> Apache right, likes to watch right. the games while he's. <laughs> yeah. Were you able to check out the YouTube videos I told you about? I did. Yeah. Yep. I uh, listened to both of the interviews that uh, that were sent to me. Um, the only thing I haven't listened to yet, and I've I've got to, um, is the uh, "Wish You Were Here" Pink Floyd. I haven't gotten because I've been this bit very That's busy. Right. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to watch that because with the where I clean at work, I yeah. could stick the interviews in my uh, phone and just listen to them, you know, and I can right. listen as I clean. Right. But I with the music video, I kind of want to get the feel and the visual of that, you know. Right. So. Well, I, I love my son's song, uh, Crying Won't Help You. And oh, that's Lorelei. another one, too. Yep. Yeah. And Lorelai did the video for that. Yeah. His name is Jeremiah Hosea. He plays bass and he also writes original music, which is wonderful. You should put him in touch with me because I'd be happy to have him come on here and, and promote that. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, that I'd be, be happy to. Yeah, okay. we could talk about his music, what he thinks of uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and w <laughs> whether he has any idea where Apache Zafra went. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to let yeah. that go. Uh, I'm glad Apache is able to laugh at that, you know, because you see that picture yeah, of a, that just of Afro there where he's got the crowbar. And then you look at him now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Apache's wonderful. As they say, many years later. But, you know, Afros were really the thing. As a matter of fact, I'll show you one of them. Um, a classic book cover that I did mm -hmm. called The Black Woman. It's a group of essays by African-American writers. Okay. And it's actually featured in the uh, Smithsonian African-American Museum, mm -hmm. see, in Washington, oh, D.C. there you go. Yeah, The Black Woman. So it's in a section called um, Black Feminism. And in the niche where it is, is that uh, famous picture of Huey P. Newton in the big uh, wicker chair. And then there's a case of um, black feminism. And then that book is featured there, which is great. I was so shocked when I saw it. I was like, yay. This is well, exciting. we all should see you. You're so classy and you're cool. Yeah, well, this is another book cover I did called Hot Day, Hot Night. Do I have oh, it wow. angled it the right way? Yeah, I like this the yellow a, shirt. 
Yeah, this was a writer named Chester Hines, uh -huh. and he did a series of stories about two detectives that were betrayed in uh, films, actually. That's where they got Cotton Cup Harlem and uh, Come Back Charleston Blue, based on Chester Himes' uh, work. Okay. Uh, these two detectives in Harlem. One was uh, played by Godfrey Cambridge, and the other one Ray was Raymond St. Jacques. And okay. I ended up yeah, I ended up with a part in um, Come Back Charleston Blue because it was interesting. I had just an extra part in Cotton Gums to Harlem. Mm -hmm. But then um, Sam Goldwyn Jr. said that he didn't want me just typecast as a Miss Goody Two Shoes. So he wanted me to be a bad girl in Come Back Charleston Blue. So. Well, you were a bad girl in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Look what Harrison Page was putting himself through for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was I was considered the goody two shoes. In the <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, at the end of the film, that's why I just got wounded because even though I had a transgression with my little jaunt that night when I thought you were studying. Um, so because I repented, that's why I only get wounded at the end and not actually murdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was so funny. Russ went through a whole thing about the American psyche and the hypocrisy of uh, American morality. And, and that's why like the scene where we're playing at the high school band um, at the prom that you see the chaperones are there. They're supposed to be watching over the teens and yet some of the, the men are still lusting over the teenage girls. And I thought that was so hysterical because many times that is what happens that those who are supposed to be watching and protecting or really have other things that they wish they could do, you see, but they're restrained. And so, and then everybody becomes so uh, critical of everybody else's behavior, and yet they have, have their own little shtick going on in the undercover, which is always very funny. Do you feel bad that uh, Superwoman was not part of the Avengers? <laughs> <laughs> oh Here he is, right there, dead in center. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was in a class by himself, that's for sure. That's oh, he was sure. great. Yeah. <laughs> that was like exactly. pre Rocky exactly. horror, too, because he kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. Because you, you know, Tim also Curry. Terrifying. Huh? No, I said also very terrifying when you think about the dynamics of the whole thing mm -hmm. and how things can go awry. And in a, in a way, we're almost living in that kind of horror show right now when you think about it, like the people storming the Capitol building. Yeah. It's, it's just so absolutely, you know, out of control, out of control. But to think that it, how easy people can fall into barbarism is really terrifying. You know, it, it's strange because, you know, um, like I read my Bible and when I look at the rainbow, I see mm -hmm. something beautiful. I see a symbol of uh, of all colors, all races. I've never, yeah, I've never had a problem getting along whether a person's female. My supervisor's female, and mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. You know, mm -hmm. um, I have no problems getting along with other races, whether. Uh, regardless of their skin color, you know, I... Well, I must tell you, Greg, I tell everybody there is only one race and that's called the human race. We have many ethnicities, but we're all of one race, the human race. We all have two hands, yeah. two feet. Exactly. Or, yeah. You know? You know, that's why we can have children together. It's mm -hmm. one race, you know, and that whole idea of, of races is part of the racist agenda because guess who was on top is considered the superior race. Guess who, you know, and it went down as you got darker and darker. So that's why I dismissed that completely. Cause um, after I left showbiz, I became a history teacher. And so that was my thing that I always told my students is only one race, the human race. You know what? I think that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. We all put our- our pants on one leg at a time 
and we all go exactly. and we face our various problems, you know. Exactly. Although my my cat says there's two races. He said there's kitty kitty races. <laughs> Well, you know what I love about cats is they really feel that they're smarter than humans. <laughs> and they're, they're, really, they're always trying to trick us and outsmart us. And I find that so cute about them that they feel, you know, these humans, such suckers. You know, we know how to get what we want from them. And I love when they don't want to listen to you. So they pretend <laughs> they didn't hear or they don't understand what you're saying until, you know, it's something they want. Then suddenly they know what to do i so i find that very cute yeah i, I love it i think mine's hiding right now <laughs> he, yeah, he, I wanted to show you this too this was another cover i did a lot of covers that people might not be aware of this one was called disco baby and oh, there was nice. a famous song called do the hustle that's on this album and so the theme used to be take this disco baby home <laughs> Did but you do, did you one. do the hustle and then go home? No, would you believe it? I never did the hustle. I and never did either. <laughs> I did, yeah, but I did all these covers. Like I did the Black Angel cover for um, Freddie Hubbard, the uh, tr jazz trumpet player, and I did a cover for Lalo Schifrin called um, the Black Widow. Yeah, oh, do you nice. See that? Oh, that's nice. Black, yeah, the Black Widow. <laughs> So those were, I did a lot of different covers and stuff, which was great, which was really great. Which but you, the which whole, I was going to say the whole Beyond the Valley of the Doll uh, persona took on a whole life of its own. And um, for example, I even have a poster my mom uh, was able to buy in Germany. And then I got another poster of the film from Japan. So it really took on a life of its own all around the world which is great. Which did you prefer, modeling or acting? Um, they're completely different, but of course you can't compare acting because that it's just, you put your whole self into it and you become another person. And um, it's very, very intense you, acting because um, it's taking on another life and becoming that other human being. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting because when I read the breakdown of what they wanted for Petronella Danford, when I walked in to meet Russ, um, I just went in with the look as I thought Pet should look. And as soon as he saw me, he said, there's Pet, that's Pet. And so that was great. And when I did the movie, I actually did get drum lessons so that I'd at least have some idea of how to hold the drumsticks and how to you know, appear to be playing the drums. And I felt very flattered because for years, I'm not joking, for a few years after the movie, anytime I went to a club, the drummers would always offer to have me come up on stage to play. <laughs> I, said, I do not know how to play drums, but I'm very flattered and honored. <laughs> but I was like, if you want to clear the club, let me come up and try to play drums for you. But but I was honored that drummers thought that I could really play because of the movie. So that was fun. I love the Carrie Nations, you know, like that song, uh, Find It. Like it just, just kind of comes right at you right at the beginning, you know, yeah, and I it, love that. Yeah, yeah, and I love Candy Man. Candy Man. That was a, that's yeah. a great one, too. That's another one. And look on up at the bottom. All the songs were really lots of fun when you think about it. They were really Oh, they were cool. fantastic. Sometimes like uh, yeah. on YouTube and I'll just, I'll list to them as I'm doing stuff on here. And it's just, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I love the music. Yeah. And because, you know, you got that dark opening that they'll circle around to at the end. And uh, right. after it does it in the opening, then you got uh, find it just comes right at you and it just yeah. shifts the tone right there yeah. at this big party. I love that too. <laughs> yeah, I just love it. I just love it. And most of the film was shot on the Fox lot mm -hmm. and because it was a very low budget film for them. And so that was interesting because for all of us, it was our first movies and, um, 
Cynthia and Dolly were actual playmates, playboy bunnies. And it was very interesting because they did a layout of us in Playboy, but I told them they could only use my picture for that one layout. And um, I had this fantastic um, photographer named Pompeo Posar. I'll never forget him because he just made you feel like a million dollars. He was just wonderful. So he was trying to get me to do a centerfold for Playboy, but I was very involved with my church and I said, no, I don't think that would work. And um, thank God I did not accept because after becoming a high school teacher, that's all I would have needed for my students now with the internet to find their very strict history teacher as a Playboy <laughs> centerfold. That would have been, oh my God, I can't even imagine. And then my two sons too, because you know, boys are very protective of their moms. So that would have been a little deep for them also. But I, I love, um, I have Dolly's Playboy, uh, May, 1966. Uh, she was the centerfold for Playboy. It's yeah. really wonderful. And I got a- as sweet as ever. Look who I found. <laughs> oh, oh, your little sweetie pie. Skittles? Oh, how sweet. Yeah. Hi, Sk Skittles. Skittles, say you? hello. Meow. Meow. <laughs> Skittles is like, Japers, you're using me to get hits. <laughs> Skittles says, you're using me to get hits. Out there. <laughs> right, exactly. Skittles I'm glad to hear she's a rescue kitty. He's a rescue. Because I'm always encouraging yeah, I'm always encouraging people to get rescue animals because it's really a shame that so many uh, don't have homes. I have a rescue really cat. Sad. My parents got a rescue Australian Shepherd and my mm -hmm. brother and his wife got a couple of ferrets that were rescues. Wow, wait, that's and great. I, if that's they needed wonderful. to find something, they just needed to look under the bed because those things would drag <laughs> everything under the bed. Uh-huh, yep. uh-huh. Oh, I love Skittles. What a cutie pie. Do you hear that, what Kitty? Cutie. Yeah. You're cute. Yeah, you're a cutie pie. <laughs> I'm a Leo, so I'm I'm cat all the way. See, she's cat all the way, Skittles. Uh -huh. Skittles is Skittles is like, does she have does she have treats? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Forget about all this human talk. Where are the treats? <laughs> That's what I love about cats too. They're so, you know right in your face you know let's get down to business well yeah, you heard that, that joke though uh dogs have masters cats have staff ah that makes uh -huh. sense i never heard that before yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's so true it is so true yeah no um no i uh love my cat he's a good good pet he is mm -hmm. yep but um, I try to think where was I, we were going here with a <laughs> Skittles guy over here, uh, what we were talking about. Uh, that's what happens. Cat, cats uh, lose your train of thought. Right. Well, I was telling you that um, the movie was basically oh, done yeah. on the Fox lot. Mm -hmm. And another thing that a lot of people didn't know that the whole point of Roger Ebert's writing was they wanted to put in every corny line that you've ever seen or heard in the film mm -hmm. in one movie and that's one of the things that i feel is very unique about the film if you really look at it and study it and then when i think about it we're talking about 50 years ago that there was an integrated girls rock group and that my boyfriend was studying to be a lawyer so there were very a lot of very interesting things in the movie that if you look back on it were very original and very ahead of its time, you might say, which I think is fascinating when we re-examine the film. I know what I was going to ask. Um, your, okay. your, your sons, have they seen the, the movie and what did they think? Um, I'm sure they've both seen the movie, but it's been a while and um, I'm so I'm sure they would have to re-examine it again. I know um, years ago, for example, Jeremiah did a fundraiser for me. Um, they showed the film 
and we were doing a fundraiser for a school in Sierra Leone called the mm -hmm. Nene Center. And so the film was shown at that time. But um, I would have to have my sons see the film again because now they're older, they're fathers, they're grown, really grown men now. So even if they had seen it before, they'd have a whole different perception now seeing it again. You know? Yeah. And obviously it's not a film for very young people to see because of all the violence and stuff in it. But um, now they're old enough to see it. Yeah. What were your um, memories uh, looking back of Russ Myers? Because I hear a lot of stuff about him, all good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, with me, I had a very, uh, I feel a very unique uh, relationship with him because he, I saw him as a big teddy bear and I remember his hands. He had like these very big hands and he was always very intense because he loved to bring out the beauty in women. And he really knew how to angle shots to really get the, the maximum out of everybody, which I loved. And uh, he always teased me because he told me I had the smallest breast of any women, any woman he'd ever worked with. So he said, so you know, I hired you for your talent, not for your boobs. <laughs> and I always thought that was very cute and funny of him. And uh, we'd always have big discussions with Russ every day because sometimes the lines were just so corny. We we're like, oh, Russ, we can't say this. This is ridiculous. This is too much. And so he did let us have input and change things so that we'd feel comfortable. But he was also um, playing games with the, with the American psyche. Because for example, if you notice, there were a lot of scenes where there was supposed lovemaking, but in very uncomfortable places. For example, if, if anybody is not from a rural area, I'll let you know right now that you do not want to have quote unquote lovemaking on straw because it sticks you, it's very, very painful. And yet there's this, you know, passionate scene with us, you know, supposedly having, a, you know, intense sexual affair in hay and it's very unpleasant. And then remember there's even the scene where, um, she's saying oh can't we ever have where our our manager says to um says can't we ever have sex in a normal place like a bed it has to be some wild thing going on it's it, so that was always funny i felt that was very funny yeah well it certainly wasn't as uncomfortable as the guy who played lance though <laughs> that, oh my that guy God. had it he had the most uncomfortable one <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah do but see, that, that yeah. was part of Russ's joke, though, you see, that all of these uncomfortable things, and it was so cute because, you know, he wanted to have like this, I always tell people, it was always so funny because he wanted me to have this big orgasm on screen, and I'm thinking, oh my God, that'll be there forever in history. No, thank you. So... <laughs> So when that's supposed to happen, he just has it splashed to some pancake batter on a skittle, on a skillet rather. So, you know, it's just very funny, just very funny. But again, that's another thing when you're doing a movie, the director might suggest certain things, but then it's up to the actor or actress to say, okay, I'll go with that or no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, you know, just cause you wanna feel comfortable. You wanna make it real. You have a great cast in this movie. I mean, Charles Napier no longer with us either. And, uh, you know, it's funny seeing how young he was in this movie. And you see him in the Blues Brothers and Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of him? Um, we didn't have that much direct contact because mm -hmm. basically what happens when you're doing a movie or just involved with the people, the immediate people, in your scenes. And for example, I was just learning how to drive because I was from New York City. And so Cynthia Myers used to come every morning to pick me up, to drive me to work every day and bring me home. And I was actually roommates with Pam Greer at the time up in the Hollywood Hills. And that's how I was able to get her in on the party scene because uh, we were doing the party scene and I had her come with me to the set that day and she got in the, in that scene. And that was a lot of fun. 
But um, Cynthia was a riot though, because she would do all kinds of crazy things like we're waiting for a light and she'd look over and if there was a cute guy in the next car, she'd flirt with him and everything and then we'd zoom off. And she thought that was such a hoot. She was always very, um, what will I say, coquettish, shall we say. <laughs> And it was just hysterical being with her all the time. She was really funny. And they were filming Myra Breckenridge at the same time um, that we were doing Beyond the Valley. So sometimes we would see that cast also, which was really um, unique. But you know what people don't understand? When you're doing a movie, we have to be on set very early in the morning, get makeup, you go over lines and everything. So it's a very intense situation. It's not like lollygagging around. And, and what's interesting doing a movie as opposed to being in a play, it's not done in sequence. So you're doing um, scenes, but they're not in sequential order. And there's nothing more frustrating, for example, than to have a very emotional scene and you're getting all worked up and thinking of emotion memory and all of your acting skills oh, lunch break, we'll start, we'll pick up after lunch. <laughs> you just have to let it go and recreate it after lunch, you know? So that's really, that was really something. Yeah. And of course you get to hang out with Dolly a lot and that, that's gonna be an awesome uh, thing too. <laughs> yeah, well, what was funny was um, she later obviously ended up getting married to Dick Martin, but Dick Martin and Dan Rowan were with the same agency that I was with, Agency for the Performing Arts. So mm -hmm. we, I used to hang out with them all the time. And that was interesting. And I think that also helped when Dolly and I reconnected so many years later, the fact that I actually knew her husband and um, his partner. Yeah, so that added another layer of connection for us. How much fun was it when uh, when you and the girls did uh, the convention and you got reunited? Oh my God. Well, first of all, I never, unfortunately, I never got to do a convention with Cynthia and Dolly. So when Do Dolly and I did a convention together and everybody was like, oh my God, they were all over us because for all these years, they had not seen either one of us. So there were people who came to us with all kinds of memorabilia that they had been collecting over the years. And um, they were so excited to see us. And so it was very, very funny for us to see the dedication of fans. It was like, wow. And some people had memorabilia from different countries and and it was so cute because because they hadn't seen us in so long, um, some of the men who were asking us questions and stuff, they were literally on their knees in front of our table to talk to us because there were no benches there or anything. And so people from other tables were coming over and saying, what the hell is going on over here? You have guys on their knees in front of your table. And Dolly and I, it was just such a hoot. And I was staying at her house at the, at the time. So we would just laugh all the way home. It was just really fun, but it's not like a whole different world. And then for us, it was fun seeing other actors that we knew and appreciated from various films. So that was really a nice experience, I must say. I really liked that. Who were the other actors that you, you met there? Um, well, I met people like from The Little Rascals and <laughs> from different shows that we've seen over the years and I, I got their autographs and I have them in my little book, you know, different shows that were very popular in the 70s and what have you. Wouldn't, and you, so cons would wouldn't you consider Apache Ramos a little rascal? <laughs> 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 I love his energy. I love <laughs> everything about Apache and he has such a wonderful attitude about life. And he's such a great grandfather, I must say, with our grandchildren. It's really great. And he was involved in the music business. So he has a lot of uh, gold albums of different um, um, albums that he worked on. And so he has a whole wall of golden albums, which is really great, and platinum albums, which is great. Yeah, he's yeah. Treated, treated me really, really well. And I, I always uh, uh, appreciated uh 
that about him. And of course, you know, you mentioned Jesus Christ Superstar. I love the fact that too, too, like you love doing the musicals and musicals are starting to make a little bit of a comeback, you know, like uh, I really yeah. enjoyed Rock of Ages a lot um, when mm -hmm. that came out. But, um, but well, you uh, know, it was funny because when I did Chiller Theater, for example, signing autographs there, uh -huh. there was a reunion of the of um, Jesus Christ Superstar. So mm -hmm. it was so funny because um, somebody came over to my table and they said, excuse me, Miss McBroom. I said, yes. He said, Jesus would like to speak with you. And so, of course, everybody turned around because they were in another room. And But it was just so funny the way the person came over in a very serious way and said, Jesus would like to have a talk with you. <laughs> and it was Ted Neely. It was great. And seeing Yvonne Elliman again, it was just wonderful. Absolutely. I and then actually, as I said, go ahead. No, I was going to say they remixed the movie. And so it was actually a private showing we had in New York. And Norman Jewison came down from Canada to see the viewing. And he was so excited to see me. He was like, oh, Marsha, it was so wonderful. It was so wonderful after all these years. Well, we, I know you got projects that are happening now that we got to plug and promote on here. Talk, uh, I'm going to give you the platform to discuss those, what you're doing now. Okay, well, I have an organization called For Our Children's Sake. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing is I have a project called A Thousand Boxes of Hope. And I've been sending material aid to names. Native Americans in um, South Dakota and Montana because mm -hmm. they have requested all kinds of things because people would not believe the condition that our Native American brothers and sisters are confronted with in our country. And for example, in the Yankton res Reservation before the pandemic, they were telling me that they had 85% unemployment and unfortunately a problem with addiction so many times grandparents end up having to raise the grandchildren and they just need everything you can imagine. So I pack up boxes and ship it out to them. And everybody is so thrilled because they said, you know, it's good to know that people outside the res are thinking about them and feeling in solidarity with them. And I'm working with groups in Malawi, in um, Sierra Leone, I have contacts in Guinea, West Africa. But for example, I got one of my husband's friends made a very sizable donation. And I was able to help one village finish a borehole project that they were working on to get water right in the village so they didn't have to go so far. Because in, in most uh, indigenous cultures, if not all, it's up to the women and the, and the children to get water. Women and girls are in charge of the water, the water keepers. So if you don't have water nearby, you could imagine how much time it takes to go and get water. And water is heavy to have to carry a big jug of water on your head. And then that's what has to last you for the whole day. So having this borehole right in the village, it has been a lifesaver for them. And then we just were able to supply another village with um, the funds to have a treadle pump uh, project to help them with their irrigation and their um, agricultural needs. And so that has been unbelievable for them. And then paying school fees because I have a lot of children who are AIDS orphans. In other words, their parents died from complications with AIDS and then you have child headed households. And so these poor children, they would basically have no future because what they do is they marry off the girls if they can't afford to go to um, high school, they just become child brides. And so their lives are basically screwed. And so now I have a whole group of kids now who have graduated to just finish medical school. Another one just finished her nursing uh, training. And so it's like, they're so excited because they're like, wow, I've changed their lives. And the whole community now looks at all of them in a whole different light. And I must say, I taught high school in New York City for many years and worked on the uh, regents exams for New York State. 
And one day I was walking down a crowded New York street and a young man came running over to me and he said, you may not remember me, but I'm so glad to run into you because I was one of your students. And he said, and I wanna thank you for believing in me. He said, because you believed in me so much, you got me to believe in myself. And now I'm going to college and I'm working my way through. But he said, if it weren't for you, he said, God only knows where I would have been or what I would have done with myself. So it brought tears to my eyes, I'm telling you, because I realized how many young people, if they just have that support and some um, adults to believe in them and to steer them in the right direction, um, things would be quite, quite different than they are today. So my big thing now in my later years is to one, I want to uh, organize all the different things I've collected over the centuries, I feel, so that my children have something orderly to deal with when I'm no longer here. And two, to do whatever I can to help um, other young people around the world so that I'll have a whole cadre of young people who will be giving back to their communities because they saw that I put out an outreach for them so that they could make it in their lives. And that has been just mind boggling and, and earth shattering. And that I work with other grassroots groups, for example, in Haiti, I have a friend who started a school in Haiti and raised money to build a clinic and it's called Friends of the Children of Las Calabas, Haiti. As I mentioned, I work with the Nene Center in Sierra Leone, and that came about after that horrifying diamond war where they were li literally chopping off people's arms and stuff, for just sickness, mental illness. And I've taken over the years, I used to take um, students to Africa because I always felt that if you travel and see for yourself firsthand, for one thing, you'll appreciate a lot more what we have available here that we tend to take for granted and um, see the obstacles and the um, challenges that other people have. And I, I would just love, I always had this sign that said, peace in our time. Wouldn't that be wonderful when you learn about the Pax Romana, where they claim there was 200 years of peace in the Roman empire. Wouldn't that be wonderful for peace to break out now on planet earth when here we have climate change and true true crises to deal with why are people still killing each other and fighting do you see what i mean when we should be joining forces to protect ourselves and protect our planet because i was thinking like here you were holding skittles the world will go on whether humans are here or not so if we want to be foolish enough to to extinguish ourselves the world is going to still be here you see what I mean? And that's where I really wish that people would get a grip and learn how to really appreciate this incredible, beautiful planet that we have in this vastness of space. And um, then we could really enjoy our lives and really have a paradise here on earth. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, when you were in Africa, I have to ask this question. What are your favorite animals to see there? Well, you know, it's funny because when you go to East Africa, that's where they have those huge uh, national parks. Mm -hmm. They talk about they talk about the great seven that everybody wants to see. You want to see elephants in the wild. You want to see rhinos. You want to see lions, giraffes. You know what I'm saying? And what I thought was very humbling going to, um, to East Africa is to see the animals on their terms in their space. So you're the one in the vehicle and you are playing by their rules. And the lodges where we stayed are, they had like dim lights by the water holes. So you could stay and watch the different animals. And the orderly way in which each group comes and uses the water hole and then leaves and then the next group come was just so humbling to see. It's just amazing. I think everyone, everyone should, should take a trip and go and see these animals on their terms in their space. And it's funny because I'm reading a book right now about elephants and um, I love, I just love animals. And it's funny because elephants are so huge, but yet 
they are, they're very quiet when they walk. Their feet are padded and mm -hmm. it's very quiet. And it, it, late at night, the predators come to the water hole. So that's when the big cats come to drink the water. And it's just so amazing. And it's funny because people have this idea. I get very upset when somebody says somebody's acting like an animal because I say, no, they're possessed by demons. Don't put that on the poor animals because animals are very orderly. A, a lion doesn't just go on a rampage just killing for the sake of killing. No, they kill when they're hungry. They eat what they kill and everything has its place. Do you see what I mean? So if you're a gazelle, obviously, you know, you don't want to eat your little grass next to the lion because that might not be such a good idea. <laughs> but it was funny because one time we were in a car and we're looking around and it's like, where are the animals? And then we looked over and there were a group of cheetahs just a few yards away from us, but they were so well camouflaged in the tall grass that we didn't even notice them. And so God forbid, had we not been in the car, that would have been just too bad. And they warn people, the animals are very calm because they're used to seeing tourists, but do not get out of your vehicle because these are wild animals. And you might have a very unfortunate situation if you, you know, don't buy by the rules. So that's always very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I watch a lot of African wildlife videos and, uh, uh, it's amazing. Some of the stuff I've seen through these, you know, um, yeah. Um, it's all, it's interesting because my oldest son, Jeremiah Hosea, mm -hmm. he, um, his dad and I took him to, um, Kenya when he was just three years old. Mm -hmm. And we had an incredible experience because we just rented a car and it was just the three of us driving around to the various places. And so when his little brother Gregory was born at three, he was walking around the house saying, I wanna go to Africa. Everyone's been to Africa and I haven't been. And I said, how many three-year-olds in the United States are yelling that they have to get to Africa? <laughs> it was just so funny. But then on the other hand, my sister Edith, she went, uh, my mom took us to Africa to uh, Cameroons and she was only five and we stayed in a hotel in Yaoundé for a whole month. And when we were coming back home, we were in Orly Airport in Paris and my little sister Edith started crying. So my mom said, why are you crying? We're on our way home. She said, you told us we were going to Africa and we've been gone all this time and we haven't been to Africa. So uh, that's when I realized that already at five, she had already been brainwashed in terms of what Africa was supposed to look like, what it's supposed to be. So here she was there and didn't even realize she was there because everybody had that image of Tarzan in the jungle swinging from trees and lions walking down the middle of the street and all kinds of nonsense, which is so far from reality, it's not even funny. And so when Jeremiah Hosea was five years old, he was in kindergarten and he wrote um, a poem about Africa. And when parents night came, the teacher said, oh, your child is so imaginative. He, he was telling us all about Africa and blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, he really went there. I said, I'm surprised because he was only three. I said, I'm surprised that he had such a vivid memory of it to um, share with everybody. But it was so wonderful because when we went, he came into the room when we were packing with a big armful of clothing that he had already outgrown. And he said, let's take this, these clothes with us because we might meet a child who could use them. And I just gave him a big hug because I said, how wonderful for you to be thinking about other children that you might meet on your trip. And sure enough, we met a little girl with her mom and she wanted the clothing. And she, they came over to our hotel to come and collect the clothes. And that, that's the whole thing. I don't like to think of it in terms of charity, but more caring and sharing. Because if we see ourselves as part of a global family, then we see it as a natural thing to wanna to share and see the best for everybody in that global family. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I get very upset when I hear the news of what's going on in various countries and the human rights abuses, because it's just so unnecessary. It's it like is. nobody gets out of here alive. So why not 
be as kind as you can to everybody and as understanding as you can. And if anybody would like to pitch in and help out in what we're doing, um, our website is F O C S F. So that's for our children's sake foundation.com. And I gather we're also on Facebook and what have you. I'm not too computer savvy and all of that. So Lorelai is much better with all of that than I am, but it's um, for our children's sake foundation.com. So it's F O C S F.com. Yeah, I have Lorelai and Durga both on uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, Dana, I've not had on here yet. So I'm going to try to make that completion. Yeah, I told you she wrote pull up to the bumper for Grace Jones, who is yes. also, who's also <laughs> a dear friend of mine, and I'm Grace's son's godmother. Um, yes, Grace Jones. Yes, I remember Grace Jones well. <laughs> yeah, the icon. <laughs> yeah. Icon extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like um, when you and your sisters get together? Because Durga was telling me when she said that, I know she said she's going to be heading back to Italy, but she said that she's going to go she, from uh, California to New York and meet with, uh, with um, Lorelai and yourself and Dana. And, and uh, what's it like when the four of you get together? Well, it's funny because number one, we don't get together all four of us very often because mm -hmm. we're all over the place. That's number one. And number two, it's just, again, feeling so blessed that, you know, that we have wonderful um, experiences all around the world, all the different people that we've had an opportunity to meet all around the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, for the month of August, one of my nieces is coming in to stay with my husband and, and me. And she got a four year scholarship to go to Swarthmore College. And she it's so cute because she called me, she lives in Houston, Texas. And she called me to say, Auntie Marsha, I just wanted to tell you what a wonderful inspiration you've been for me for my life. And I thought how sweet of her, a teenager to call me to tell me this. And she's a math genius. She's already done projects with NASA in high school. And it was so cute because she said, I have a confession to make. I said, what is that? She said, I just love math so much. She said, I can't believe it. And I said, isn't that hysterical? Now, she wanted to be an engineer. And then she decided she wants to go into forensics because mm -hmm. she said there's so many people in prison in, in Texas, for example, who are falsely accused. And if they had the right forensics working on their side, a lot of people could end up getting out of their situation. And I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? Again, young people thinking of how, what can I do? What contribution can I make to make the world a little better for others who may not be as fortunate as I am? And so that's the kind of thing I'd like to keep perpetuating. For example, um, when I was a teacher, in high school, I had what we called a leadership class. And we would discuss different life issues and get involved in different community projects. And for example, one of my former students called me up for Mother's Day to wish me happy Mother's Day and to again, thank me for being part of her journey. And she now got a fellowship to um, at Harvard and she's into geriatric medicine and she's now a full fledged doctor. And it's like, wow. And I said, that's what's so wonderful um, being involved with teaching. And while I was teaching, believe it or not, I very rarely let my students know anything about my other life because so many of them would like to get into um, you know, um, hip hop or whatever. And it's like, fine, that's fine and good, but most people don't get there. So I don't want you not doing your schoolwork because you think you're going to be some huge star overnight and that's not reality. So I really kept that very much as another part of my existence. 
And even if some of them did find out, it was like, oh, well, if you did all of that and you went to all these places, what are you doing here? And I said, well, to share some of those experiences with you, because like, could you imagine how exciting it was being a history teacher and having been to a lot of the places that we were reading about in our books? And I could tell them my personal experience. And then as a teacher, I got, I ended up getting a James Madison fellowship to get my master's degree. So I got um, that fellowship in, and that was an honor because there's only one person per state each year who's chosen to get this fellowship, which pays for your master's degree. And then I got a letter from Daniel Patrick Moynihan at, um, congratulating me for representing New York State. And it's so exciting because now they built a special um, part of the Amtrak train center in New York and it's called Moynihan Hall. So every time I see it, I think about that beautiful connection that I had, even though I never met him personally, the fact that he took the time to write a letter to thank me um, for representing New York State. That was wonderful. And then, yeah, uh, yeah and then Roger Ebert invited me out to um, Illinois years ago to get a thumbs up award for the movie. And he, it was so touching because he had a special device so he could talk through this oh, yeah. scene because he had that, um, his cancer. Mm -hmm. But again, he was always so down to earth because I remember he was being interviewed one time and somebody asked him, oh, oh, you know, what a horrible thing that you got this cancer and all this. And he said, yeah, but you know, what can you, what can you do? Because he said, you know, this is the way it is. This is what happened. And he just accepted his fate, and but always kept um, a very cheerful attitude about it, which I thought was very beautiful. And he yeah. said, I wouldn't wish this on anyone else. So it's not a matter of saying, oh, you know, I'm sorry I got it. Because he said he wouldn't want anyone else to get it either, you know, which I thought was very, um, again, thoughtful and beautiful. And I got to meet his wonderful wife, Chez. And that was just really, really great, really great. Yeah, no, I, I think it's wonderful. And I, I like what the, you and your sisters are doing, you know. Um, I know I've heard about Black Floyd, which I, I find very, very interesting. And yeah, but, you know, the two of them actually sang with Pink Floyd. Yep. So because they did that video, mm -hmm. uh, with Wish You Were Here, that's why they did Black Floyd. And I didn't even know until I saw Lorelai's video that Pink Floyd got their name from two African-American blues musicians. And she includes that in the video that she did, which is really wonderful. Because the British, I must say, the British um, stars, they were very open about how influenced they were by African-American music. You know, the Rolling Stones, all of them, Eric Clapton, everybody has been very upfront. And that's another thing I can't stand when people take things from other cultures or whatever, and then don't own up to, oh, I was inspired by this or that and pretend that they just made it up themselves. I can't stand that. Cause it's like give credit where credit is due. And that would also help bring people together to see how much we borrow from each other and look at each other, for example, I used to dance as a teenager with uh, Catherine Dunham, who was a very famous African-American uh, choreographer. And she did the choreography for Aida at the Metropolitan Opera House. So mm -hmm. my sister Dana and I danced in Aida at the old Met and then at the new Met at Lincoln Center. So in part of her training, when we were studying with her, she would have us learn how to sit for a Japanese tea ceremony. And here I was 15 years old thinking, what on earth do I need how to sit for a Japanese tea ceremony? Lo and behold, I end up getting invited to Japan three times and everybody was super impressed that I knew the proper way to sit for the Japanese tea ceremony. So when Ms. Dunham was still with us, I thanked her and I said, Ms. Dunham, see, you had that vision that um, one day this might be a useful thing to know. And I said, sure enough, you were right. And so that was really funny. And she, she said, uh, well, thank you for letting me know that. <laughs> but again, open yourself up to every possible thing that you can that's positive 
I would always tell my students, because for example, I always, always wanted to go to the Dead Sea, for example, because I thought how interesting that would be to be at the lowest point in the earth and floating in the water. Sure enough, when I got to do Superstar, um, I had cut my, my um, ankle and it couldn't heal because we were always dancing. So finally we got to the Dead Sea and I was able to just float in that water for 45 minutes and it has 32 different minerals in it. So it's really kind of oily. And needless to say that wound just closed up immediately because of all of those minerals in the water. And it was just so soothing and to see the purple um, lights of the sky as the sun was setting and I'm floating in the Dead Sea. And I thought, see, here's a wish come true. And then I've always wanted to go to the Great Wall of China, ended up getting invited to China and going on the Great Wall and going to visit Tibet. So I actually went to Lhasa and I went to the Patala Palace where the Dalai Lama was raised and it's a thousand room palace. So of course you don't visit all thousand rooms, but just the idea of walking through those uh, rooms and the incredible artwork and everything, it was just, oh my God, this is just truly wonderful. So wonderful. So I like to buy, I've now gotten into buying books from authors from different countries so that I could start learning what it's like for a young woman in Tehran, for example, or, you know, some a Chinese um, author, you know, reading something and to see their moods. And I've been buying books by um, African writers too. So just, I just want to enjoy exploring life and growing as for as long as I have. And Hopefully I want that my grandchildren are old enough that I can share some of all of this with them. For example, Jeremiah Hosea's children are trilingual because his wife is from Belarus. And so her mom speaks to them only in Russian. Then the mother speaks to them only in French. And then we speak to them in English. And then I do know a little bit of French because I lived there for six months when I was with Miss Dunham. Uh, dancing in a musical comedy. So here it is, my little um, grandson, for example, who's almost four, he can already say his alphabet, his uh, Cyrillic alphabet. So I'm sorely impressed, but I'm saying these are the children of the future, these little international people. And it's like they're born into their time, you know, where they're like my son, my uh, grandson Hendrix, he's shown me things to do on my my cell phone, for example, because I was like one of the last people to get a cell phone. But it's so funny when you have a little grandchild who's there showing you how to do tech things, you know, it's really very, very humbling and beautiful and wonderful. I remember yeah. back when I was in school, we had typewriters, we had phones uh -huh. that stuck to the wall. <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was so cute because like um, my son Jeremiah once he was in the bathtub and I had to run out to get something. I came back in and he, he had actually taken toilet paper and threw it up to the ceiling. And I looked in the room in shock and he looked at me, looked at the ceiling and he said, artwork, mommy, artwork. <laughs> Oh my God, these children are too. He, he, he's going to love Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. And both, both he and his brother Gregory are both black belts in karate. And Jeremiah is also a chess teacher. And uh, Gregory just started his own moving business called uh, Benjamin Moving Company. And oh. so. Yeah, so that's been a big thing because believe it or not, with this pandemic, I can't believe how many people have been moving from, you know, all over the country now. And because of a lot of people now working from home because mm -hmm. of the whole online thing, that's been very interesting too, the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I worked through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, through the whole thing. I mainly work uh, back shift night and 
So, which is nice because there's nobody around to yeah. hassle and I can just stick podcast in my ear and listen. And uh, then I go home in the yay hours in the morning and while everybody else is rushing to get their coffee, I'm going to settle in well. Well, you know, it's funny here um, in Albany at the Capitol building, they claim that the building is haunted. Uh -huh. So they, they actually have tours and they tell you the different things of ghost sightings. And they said the people, some people have actually quit because if they have to work there at night, some of them have seen or heard the ghosts moving around <laughs> the building and it scared the, the crap out of them. And they, you know, they don't want to work the night shift in that building. You know, so it's funny. The place I'm going to be working tonight cleaning, I worked at last night and I've been told like it's a, a craft college and um, do, do they do arts and crafts and stuff. And I've been told that there's a uh, ghost on floor two and floor four and i'm like good if i see them they can chip in and help me take the garbage out <laughs> and then i come home and kitty does not have my breakfast ready uh-huh well <laughs> she doesn't want to spoil you she doesn't want to spoil you <laughs> he wants me to spoil and, him and <laughs> Be happy that that the kitty doesn't bring you a nice little mouse to put by your head when you wake up. Oh, you've had that experience, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, a present just for you. A kitty special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we've I've had a few bugs in here and the cat will sit there and stare at them. I'm like kitty. Stare at them. Yeah. You're, you're supposed to you're on security here, kitty. No, well, they're, they're very curious animals and they, they're very um, attentive. And I, I love their patience that they could sit there and watch for the longest time until it's the right moment. And we even had once an invasion of possum in our house and the cats got along with the possum. I could not <laughs> believe it. And the possum ate their food and, and um, everybody was fine. It was like unbelievable. But then I said, here it is, animals of different species are becoming friends and everything. Cause there's a website you can go to with different animals who are friends with animals of another species. And here humans still can't get it together to respect and love one another. It's very sad. It it's is. Sad. Mm -hmm. It is, absolutely it is. Yep. You got anything else you wanna promote on here? Well, what I really want to promote is for people to really use this time to do some introspection, think about yourself, think about your relationship with other people. Um, and I always tell people, you can't show love to anybody else if you don't love yourself first. So um, many times we beat up on ourselves too much and I really want to promote that people um, take a deep breath and be grateful for every tiny little thing that we have. Just being able to breathe in and breathe out, having clean water, clean air, don't take anything for granted. And I've always, I always tell everyone to give thanks every night before you go to sleep, give thanks that you've made it to your bed safely in the morning when you wake up to give thanks for the previous day, give thanks for um, being alive and to ask for guidance because many times positive spirits are trying to guide us and trying to lead us to the right things. And many times we don't listen and then we can get into a lot of trouble. And um, even though people are getting vaccinated and everything with the pandemic, still be careful and be cautious because I hear a lot of people, they're so busy wanting to get back to, I, it'll never be what it was pre-pandemic. And the, it's, the virus is still amongst us. It's still coming up with variations. So stay cautious, keep that social distancing, um, wear those masks when you're around other people because you don't know if they were vaccinated or not. And so you have to be careful because already in our country, uh, we're seeing spikes in different parts of the country because people are letting their guard down too soon. And um, I'd hate to see what we went through 
last year was just absolutely horrific. It was very, very terrifying. And uh, we even had makeshift morgues around New York City that was so gruesome. It was like living in a, a twilight zone experience. So what I'm saying is to nobody gets out of here alive. So let's enjoy every day that we have together. And if anybody would like to contribute to what I'm doing in terms of helping people in um, more unfortunate circumstances, like people always say, well, what about this country? Yeah, but we have a lot of means of helping one another in this country. In many other countries, they have no social support the way we have here. And that's why I've been focusing because the, the money goes a lot further helping um, people in uh, dire straits around the world. And especially when I've been there, I've seen it myself. I, I always say I squatted with the best of them. And so um, as a child going to visit Africa, I always said I have to make a difference in this world. And, and that's what I try to do as much as I can and instill that with my children and hopefully with my grandchildren and to spread that good message to everybody, to do what you can to um, improve your own life, to improve the life around you. Because I even think, think of people who um, left their homes and they were angry with their partners or whatever, and then they were never to return. And how sad that is, is, oh my God, how many times have we heard somebody say, oh, I wish if I could have just seen so-and-so one more time, I would have told them I love them. I would have, you know, given them that hug or whatever. So don't hold back, you know, be there. And I know many times we're afraid to be there for someone because we don't want to get hurt. Yeah, sometimes we do get hurt, but never be afraid to be loving and to be giving and to be as understanding as we can because nobody's perfect. As my dad would always say, nobody is perfect save the Lord God whom none have seen. And so that's what we should always think about of being there in um, just that whole idea of a global embrace, global cherishing and uh, fulfillment. And uh, if that's something that I can share with people to just take those deep breaths and to be loving. Because if you notice it's so, hard, it's so easy for people to be insulting to other people, to be mean to other people. But that idea of just being kind, being just smiling. Like I'll never forget one time I was in an airport and there was a, a Japanese family there and they're kind of looking at me in a strange way and I'm looking at them. And then I thought, you know what? Maybe give it a benefit of a doubt. And I had this little basket that I'd gotten in West Africa and I offered it to the little girl who was sitting there with her parents. Oh, and she was so thankful. And then they made origami uh, bir birds for me. And then we exchanged. Then the father explained that they were just on their way to the United States for the first time. And, and it was just, they were just really curious about me. And so I said, see that? I could have you know, given them kind of a frown or whatever. But just turning it around, it turned out it was a very beautiful exchange. And that's what I always like to see people do is change those negative things to something positive. And maybe that person is just as curious as you are, and, but we're afraid to make that move, to make that step. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's my message to everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know what? It was wonderful having you back on here tonight, you know, and having you on here for a second time and uh, and uh, hearing your stories. I'm glad that uh, glad you're surviving out there and all this. I am fully vaxxed now. Uh, so, <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's so, yeah. But um, here's one thing I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for this. <laughs> Yeah, I enjoy this movie, and uh, uh, there's so much to like in it, too, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, 51 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yep, could have done something for the 50th anniversary if uh, the pandemic wasn't busy uh, messing everything up, but 
I know, I know. And as I said, anybody who'd like to make any kind of contribution to help us, because we're way behind in sending out those school fees, but the schools have been working with us because I even got some groups to start study groups so that the children who can't afford to go to um, school can learn from the other children who are going to school. And that's been very successful. Mm -hmm. So um, any, any um, donations would be well, well appreciated. Well plug, appreciated. plug that again, the organization one more time. Okay, uh, my organization is called For Our Children's Sake. Mm -hmm. And the um, website is, is, are the initials, F-O-C-S-F, -S -S as in foundation, dot, uh, dot org. And also they can reach me through Lorelei, they can reach me through uh, my son, Jeremiah Hosea, and who also teaches remote chess classes. And um, my husband, Louis Small, he's also on the internet, Louis Small. Um, he is a musician. He played piano for Richie Havens for 10 years. And so he traveled all around the world with Richie. So that was wonderful also, knowing Richie Havens. And for those who don't know who Richie Havens was, he's the man who opened Woodstock. And he had an incredible career, an incredible voice. And uh, he'll always be near and dear in our hearts. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it was so wonderful having you come on here tonight, and uh, I appreciate your husband getting you hooked up to Zoom, and so we could see you again. I love the earrings, you know. You're a class act. From from Burkina Faso, West Africa. Yeah. Oh, you can get your uh, shiny. Yo, oh, look at that. That is nice. This is my. Uh... Yeah, I'll turn it down. A oh, look at that. The glitter. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you are classy. Some of that Carrie Nation's coming out there. Yeah, yeah. And also, everyone can always reach me also through Apache Ramos, needless to say. So there are a lot of ways to get hooked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I say com com communicating with Apache. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he's always on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I text with him quite a bit too. <laughs> so, uh, he's but, great. Absolutely yeah. great. Oh yeah, he, lo he loves to laugh. Yeah, well, laughter is good for the soul. Laughter is good for the soul. It releases those endorphins, you know, that relax our body. Because stress is a killer. Stress is mm -hmm. a big killer. You know, they, they announced, for example, on the news today that on top of the over 600,000 people we lost last year in the United States from the pandemic, we lost over 93,000 people who OD'd on drugs and because they didn't have the support systems that they normally would have had if the pandemic hadn't hit. So um, that's why I'm saying to reach out to people because many times people are crying for help and uh, nobody's really paying them any mind or taking them seriously. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's very painful because once it's over, it's over. And then everyone's crying afterwards, like, oh my gosh, I should have seen the signs, you know? So that's what I'm saying to just really be very, um, try to be as thoughtful as we can and, and think of <clears throat> surrounding ourselves with um, beauty, love and positive energy which is the McBroom sisters and a yeah. perfect description right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thank you, Greg, so much for having me again. And yes. Thank you for reaching out to people and mm -hmm. giving them, you know, some fun inside um, views on people. That's fun. It's a wonderful thing. Well, I've had Apache on here three times. I'm going to have uh, Dolly on again. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I have you on here. I'm going to have Durga and Laura lie back and um, I'm going to uh, try to get uh, Dan on here for the first time. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, be great. Get, get the whole great projects she's yeah. working on. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Keep doing what you're doing. You're an inspiration to all of us, you know, and uh, I'm honored. I, I, I'm blessed 
to just talk to you, you know, and, uh, you know, and every time I watch Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, it's like, you know, it's, it's nice. I got to talk to you and I got to talk to Dolly and uh, have that experience, makes the movie even more special, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And talk to Harrison. Yep. It really does. It yep. really does. Yep. And as I said, um, what people don't understand is that when one is doing a movie, it is a very intense situation because one, you have to become another person. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to be Petronella Danford. So you think as that person 24 seven. Uh, we had to be in the set very early in the morning to get all made up and everything and to try to stay gorgeous for the whole day and to get home, eat, go over lines and want to just, you know, collapse in bed to be up and bright, bright eyed and bushy tailed for the next day. And so that's something that people don't realize is the intensity of doing a movie. Um, and as I said, because it's not done in sequence, in sequence rather, that's another challenge for actors because um, there's something called continuity. So for example, if I'm talking to you and I do this on a certain line, I have to remember to do that again for if we repeat that line so that we have the continuity of that action. So they have people on the set who actually take notes in terms of what was um, done when to make sure that they have continuity when they're editing the film, that it all works out. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful genre. And I met some wonderful people out on, at Fox when we were doing the movie. And it was so great to meet people who were so dedicated in their, in their skills, you know, the set designers and the costume designers. And, it's, it's a beautiful world. It really mm -hmm. is a very beautiful world, very intense. And it was funny too, because when um, my sister Dana and I danced at the Met, it turns out that my son Jeremiah and um, Dana's daughter, Chanana, they ended up also uh, performing at the Met in the children's choir. And the same guy who helped dress Dana and myself when we were kids was still there. So he dressed our children. So that was again, amazing that the dedication that people have with these jobs. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. So Dana will tell you about her daughter, Chanana, who has also some beautiful projects and a, a song she just put out. So um, she'll have a lot to share with you as well. I'll be reaching out. Yeah, that would be great. Before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Okay. Yeah. Tell, tell me what to say. Just, <laughs> what to just, do. just state your name and and uh, your association with Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and say you're okay. listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. Okay. Hi, I'm Marcia McBroom, and I'm one of the stars of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. I play the part of Petronella Danford in the girls rock trio, the Carrie Nations. And I love that we're watching the Gil, the Greg Gilbert show, the Python special. And I love you, Greg. And I love the idea that you named your show, the Python show, because I love snakes. <laughs> I do too. I do too. I had to babysit two boa constrictors once in France. And that was quite an experience. <laughs> well, I don't own a snake because uh, I just find with cats are just so affectionate. I don't think a, a snake's not going to purr around me. <laughs> no, and you might find the cat in the python. So you wouldn't want that either. Because no. they will eat the cat. They would definitely eat the kitty head first. Actually, the African rock python, I've seen a video of them eating impala. <gasps> Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, they, they are amazing. They are amazing. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing I've ever caught wind of one of them eating. Yeah, I've uh, seen them eat like small pigs. I've seen them eat the, those giant, giant pythons. Yeah. I've heard stories of anaconda eating mm -hmm. water buffalo, but I haven't, oh, seen, oh, well, I haven't that, seen footage that, of it. Yeah, well, that may be a tiny baby that was just born. 
Yeah, because I, mean, yeah. I know anacondas are the thickest of the snakes, but they're only the third longest. Yeah, I mean, the reticulated python and the African rock python. But mm -hmm. I have seen uh, uh, photos of whatnot of uh, the African rock, rock python eating um, an impala. <laughs> I say we have deep respect for these animals. Everybody has their role to play mm -hmm. and their place to be. And um, God help us if we don't get a hold of this whole climate change situation. You see the whole of Europe is being flooded. I just saw a program that even in uh, Utah, the uh, Salt Lake is drying up. Mm -hmm. And so humans had better hop to it and <laughs> and do what we need to do to slow this thing down or we're going to be in, in serious, serious, no return land. I agree. Okay. So I in agree. terms of the message, climate change is real, folks. Let's all do our parts. Please, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, don't drop plastics because plastics end up in the ocean and end up killing ocean creatures because they eat the plastics thinking it's food and so we really have to be nurturers and, and um, protectors of my, our beautiful Mother Earth. And that's why this interview is being done in my Mother Earth room. And thank you again, Greg. And mm -hmm. yes, a shout out for the Greg Gilbert Python show, special, wonderful show. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on here and uh reminiscing about beyond the valley of the dolls and apache ramos afro and <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the other mcbroom sisters on here and uh we'll continue to promote uh what you guys are doing i Thank i you. i love it absolutely so god bless you stay safe Thank and you. you have yourself a blessed weekend thank you dear bye-bye bye-bye